Turn with me, if you will, to Zechariah chapter 14. We're going to read some prophetic words concerning the end times. A prophecy spoken by Zechariah about the times of the end. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst, and I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses will be rifled, and the women shall be ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth, and he will fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it towards the south. We'll take up um, the reading again in that same chapter in verse 6. At the end of verse 5 it says, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish, it shall be one day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at even time it shall happen, that it will be light. And in that day it shall be, that the living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, and half of them towards the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one, and his name is one. Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that every one who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come to keep the feast of tabernacles. For this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Father, this morning we pray that you will bless your word. We pray for revelation to come to our hearts. And we pray that, Lord, you will speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. In the, the last, last week I spoke about four major signs that the Jesus spoke about that would take place prior to his coming again, his return to this earth. We spoke about disasters in the world, deserters in the church, a dictator in the Middle East, and darkness in the sky. Jesus encouraged us to look for these signs that would come into the world and interpret them correctly just as we might interpret the signs of nature. In other words, Jesus said, when you look at the sky at night, you can tell what kind of day it's going to be tomorrow. He said about the fig tree, which was representative of Israel, 
when the sap rises and the bur buds burst into leaf, the advent of summer is signaled. Even so, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. When you see these four major signs unfolding, his second coming is near. It's right at the door. I've entitled what I want to share with you this morning, the time of his coming. The time of his coming. When Jesus gave that forecast of events leading up to his second arrival, he didn't give them, friends, for us to argue over dates. In fact, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man returns. The forecast that Jesus gave of events that would take place prior to his return, they were given to us so we would avoid the dangers of speculating when the Lord was going to come. History is full of examples of those who put an actual date on his second coming. Martin Luther, the great reformist, he declared in his lifetime that the Lord would return in 1636. Well, 1636 has come and gone, and the Lord hasn't returned. He was wise enough to make a date that would happen after he died, so he didn't have to live with the consequences of, of predicting. John Wesley, the great reformist, the great preacher, he too announced a date when he believed the Lord would return. He said the Lord would return in 1874. Well, Wesley was wise enough too to predict a date that was well in advance of the time that he would have left this life. He didn't have to live with the consequences. But there were others, like William Miller, who was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. He said the Lord would return in the year of 1844. Charles Russell, the founder of the JWs, he said the Lord would return in 1914. Problem was that both Russell and uh, Miller both lived beyond those dates that they had predicted. So they had to live with the consequences of declaring that the Lord was going to come at a date and when he didn't come, well, they had to eat humble pie and live with the, the, the folly of their actions. I can remember in the 1980s, there was a lot of stir in Christian circles about the coming of the Lord. In 1948, Israel was declared an independent state. Ben-Gurion, the Israeli prime minister, the miracle of a state, the state of Israel, being birthed in a day, it happened as the Bible predicted. And Ben-Gurion announced that Israel had become a state, a national identity once again. When in the 80s, a lot of Christians were saying that this generation would not pass away when you see the, the blooming of the fig tree. This generation would not pass away until everything was be ful fulfilled. And I can remember in the 1980s that a lot of Christians were saying the Lord's return would happen in 1988. Forty years after the state of the independence of Israel. Well, that's come and gone. Friends, can I say at this stage of events in history, no one can know the year when Jesus is going to return. Although some of the signs that Jesus spoke about, that we talked about last week, are already clearly visible. It's also clear that the Lord's return cannot be this year. It can't be next year or even in the next few years. 
The hope of his coming in our lifetime will depend on how quickly events in the world accelerate. And the Bible says the man of sin, the Antichrist, will be revealed. I want to say this morning, the end can come very quickly. It can come more quickly than we anticipate. We are people upon whom the ends of the age has come. We are living in an unparalleled moment in time. The days that we find ourselves living in are unrivaled in the history of the world. Friends, I want to say there has never been a day like this day. We are the first generation to really live with the possibility that we could well be alive when the final curtain comes down. Some of us sitting here this morning mightn't see the undertaker. Well, you'll not see him anyhow, but you know what I mean. The, the undertaker won't be sent for, but you might well see the undertaker. Amen? We could well be some of the people that are referred to in the Bible as we who are alive and remain. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we're not all going to die. We could be alive and remain when the Lord Jesus comes back again. At this stage, we do not know the year of his coming. But I believe we do know at what time of the year Jesus will return. None of us know the year, but I believe we can know the time of year when the Lord will return. And the reason we can know this is because God, in his foreknowledge, he wrote into the Jewish rituals, especially into the annual calendar of Jewish feasts, that the Jews celebrate every year. He wrote into the feasts things that speak to us about what was, what is, and what is to come. The Jews had three major festivals that every male had to travel to Jerusalem, to the temple, to worship. Wherever they were in Israel, they had to make their way to Jerusalem for these three major festivals. The people gathered in Jerusalem for Passover, for Pentecost, and for Tabernacles. They were the three major Jewish feasts. And we see, friends, in these Jewish feasts, how God has written into history and in his foreknowledge spoken about the events that were to take place. We see the death and resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ in Passover. At Pentecost, we see the um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And at Tabernacles, I believe, is foreshadowed in the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the coming and the timing of the Lord's return to this earth. The first Jewish feast was Passover, the major feast. It was a time when the Israelites celebrated their deliverance from Egypt. They were in Egypt for 430 years, and God, by his strong and mighty hand, he brought them out. And the night that God brought them out of the land of Egypt, a lamb had to be slain. Not any lamb. It had to be a lamb that was perfect, without blemish and without spot. It had to be taken from amongst the herds. It had to be examined closely that there was no defect or blemish in the lamb. And then the lamb had to be slain. And the blood had to be sprinkled upon the doorposts of the house. And that night God said the angel would, of, of the Lord would go over the land of Egypt and any house that did not have the blood applied 
there would be death in that house. The firstborn of every one in that family would die. But God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes. And of course, you know that the Jews did exactly what the Lord had commanded. And God brought them out of Egypt with a great arm of deliverance. Passover is celebrated in our diaries during the months of March and April. At Passover, a lamb was to be killed at three o'clock in the afternoon in the temple. It was followed by a few days later by the first fruits of harvest. What was written in the Old Testament and amongst these Jewish festivals was only a, a foreshadowing of something that would take place in the new, something that would happen. This foreshadowing in the Passover feast, it was clearly fulfilled in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. On that first Good Friday, remember he died at Passover. On that first Good Friday, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the perfect Lamb of God bowed his head and died. Dying for the sins of the whole world. Paul writing says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. On the third day, he rose again. And the Bible says, he became the first fruits of all those who slept. So in Passover, we have this wonderful example, this foreshadowing of the work, the redemptive work that Jesus would do on the cross. Thank God this morning, friends, the blood's applied. Amen. We are being set free because of what he did upon the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. Judgment is past and we have life and freedom through our Lord Jesus Christ. The second feast was Pentecost. That took place during May or June in our calendar. At the feast of Pentecost, they gave thanks for the law that was given at Sinai, 50 days after the first Passover. So the Jews celebrated the Passover in the wilderness, and 50 days later they were at Sinai, and they received the law of God. And Pentecost was a feast that celebrated this occasion when the law was given to Moses on Sinai. Just to remind ourselves, friends, on that first Pentecost... If you read in the scriptures, you read that 3,000 people, 3,000 rebels died. Can you remember when Moses came down from the mountain and they'd made the golden calf? The Levites strapped on their swords and 3,000 people died uh, uh, on that first Pentecost, on that first celebration of the law being given by Moses or to Moses. You don't need me to tell you that the Feast of Pentecost was wonderfully fulfilled in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place seven weeks after Calvary. Seven weeks after Jesus died. Fifty days after Jesus died, the Feast of Pentecost was celebrated. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the 50th day, the first Pentecost, isn't it amazing, 3,000 rebels died. On this day, 3,000 penitents were brought to life. Amen. About 3,000 souls were saved through the accomplishments of Christ. So we see this wonderful foreshadowing in in the Feast of Pentecost, in the Feast of Passover. But then we come to the third festival, which was the Feast of Tabernacles. Usually, 
September, October in our diaries it takes place. This Feast of Tabernacles, I believe friends, and I want to suggest to you this morning, that God has written into this feast the time that His Son will return from heaven. At this time of the at this time we do not know the year when Jesus is going to come back again. But I do believe we know the time. Jesus will return to this earth during the Feast of Tabernacles. At this feast, the Jews recalled the provision of manna in the wilderness. It was the most joyous of all the feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a time of celebration. It was a time when the Jews would make booths or, or little shelters on the, on the slopes of the Mount of Olives and they would camp out for a whole week. It was a joyous time, a time of great celebration. It was a time the Jews recalled the provision of manna in the wilderness. It lasted for seven days. On the eighth day of the feast the Jews would hold a wedding ceremony and they would get married to the law. At the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrated it with great joy and rejoicing. It celebrated the final ingathering of the harvest. The harvest was to be celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's interesting, friends, that as Christians we celebrate two of the major festivals or the feasts of, of, of the, the Jewish nation. We celebrate Passover, which we refer to as Easter, which will happen next week. We celebrate Pentecost, which is often referred to as Whitsuntide. But isn't it amazing, why do we not celebrate Tabernacles? Do we not celebrate out of ignorance or is it because we see no relevance of Jesus in tabernacles? Yet I want to suggest that Christ is clearly portrayed in this feast, foreshadowed in the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus was probably born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Most people know that he wasn't born on the 25th of December. There is every likelihood that he could have been conceived on the 25th of December. But he was not born on that festival, that pagan festival that Christians have got hold of that celebrates the moon, uh, the sun in the northern hemisphere. A little research into the Bible reveals that Jesus was born 15 months after Zechariah the priest was on duty in the temple. Zechariah, he was of the priestly line of Abiathar. If you read in the Bible, according to the Jewish calendar, they were in, on duty in the fourth month. Whilst Zechariah was serving in the temple, he had that revelation that appearance of the angel that told him that his wife would be with child. It's a fascinating study that and I haven't got time to go into it today but the, the, the whole f there were 32,000 priests serving the temple for a whole year. When Zachariah was on call the Bible tells us he was an old man a priest began to serve at 30 years of age. And Zachariah had served for a long time. And only once in a priest's lifetime, if it happened, when the lots were drawn, they would go and burn incense into the temple. Every priest longed for that job. That daily job. Once you'd done it, you couldn't do it anymore. And we know that Zacharias had never been chosen to do this job until this day, when he went into the temple. The Bible says the lot fell upon Zechariah. 
And for the first time in his life, he had the privileges of privilege to go into the temple and burn incense to the Lord. Whilst he was there, he had the revelation of the, this angel appeared to him, spoke to him. He was struck dumb. Well, we haven't got time to go into all that, but it's a fascinating study. But Jesus was born 15 months after Zacharias was on duty in the temple. The possibility is that he was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Every possibility, if you work the dates out. That Jesus was born during this festival of the Jews called Tabernacles. I wonder if this is what John meant when he said those words. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Tabernacled amongst us. That's what that word means. It means tabernacle uh, amongst us. We know that during his earthly life, Jesus visited this feast. At one time during his ministry, his brothers were very skeptical about some of the claims that were being made about their elder brother. And knowing that this was the very time of year when the Jews expected the Messiah to appear, they urged Jesus to go up to the feast. It's interesting, his response to them. Listen to what Jesus said. The time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. And he remained in Galilee. Afterwards, he went up to the feast, the Bible says, not openly, but secretly. During the course of the week, whilst he was in Jerusalem... Not many people knew he was there. There was a lot of talk about him. A lot of speculation about the Jews concerning Jesus. Was he the Messiah? Was he the one to come? Some said he's a good man. Some said he deceives the people. Read about it in John chapter 7. The whole nation was talking about Jesus of Nazareth. But in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles... He went into the temple, the Bible says, and he taught the people from the temple. And he did make a public appearance on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's called that last great day of the feast. The first seven days during the feast, prayer would be made for Jew to come and water the earth. But on the eighth day, which was referred to as the last great day of the feast... The Jews would not only pray for Jew, but they would pray for rain. On the last day, the eighth day, the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam with a golden bowl or a golden pitcher. They would fill it with water from the pool of Siloam and they would make their procession back up to the temple in Jerusalem. And there in the temple... As they were in the temple, they would pour the water out on the altar and they would pray for God to send the rains next year. The people would be singing and shouting and making a great sound as they were believing God that the harvest would come again. The rain would come. It's interesting as the priests were making their way up to the temple in that great procession, having been to the pool of Siloam, Jesus stood there and cried out, the Bible says, with a loud voice, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being, out of his heart, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. 1 Corinthians 4, it talks about the rock that followed them in the wilderness. The smitten rock that followed them and the water gushed out. Here Jesus was fulfilling this, this prophecy that was spoken about himself during this feast. This caused a lively debate about his identity. Was he the Messiah? 
There was great debate in high circles. The, the, the religious leaders had got together, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he, it was dismissed that he was the Messiah. Because he, was, he, he came from Nazareth and not Bethlehem. If only they'd gone a little bit more into his pedigree, eh? However, the full, real fulfillment, friends, of the Feast of Tabernacles is in the second coming of Jesus Christ and not the first. We know when he visited the Feast of Tabernacles, there was fulfillment of prophecy about him. But it, 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 it speaks more of his second coming than his first. Just as he died at Passover, just as the Lamb was slain and became uh, the uh, the sacrifice the perfect sacrifice that god accepted the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world just as he died at pentecost uh, at passover just as he sent his spirit at pentecost he will return at tabernacles right on time friends god's working to a timetable in the fullness of time at the right time, God sent his son into this world. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, it couldn't happen until it had fully come. God sent the Holy Spirit upon his people. And friends, just as it was then, the time for his return will happen at the right time in God's time, during the Feast of Tabernacles. It makes it more interesting what Jesus said to his brothers, didn't he? When they urged him to go up to the feast. My time has not yet come. Little did the world realize that it would be two millenniums later, when his time will fully come. When he will go to that feast. Every Jew knows that the Messiah will come at tab Tabernacles. The prophets foretold it. Zechariah, we've read it today, spoke about living waters. What did Jesus do on that last great day of the feast? If any man thirsts, let him come unto me, and out of his inner man shall flow rivers of living water. We read Zechariah's prophecy this morning that spoke about the, the river of God flowing out of the temple, going towards the Dead Sea. Everything that the river touching, living. Living water flowing out of the temple, representing Jesus. Zechariah also predicted that after his return, the nations would go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Why should the nations of the world go up every year at this time to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles? Friends, I want to suggest it will be an annual time every year when the nations of the world will celebrate that this was the time that the Son of God returned to this earth. It will be a yearly memorial to remind the world that at this time, Jesus returned. Every time at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews pray that the Gentiles might attend the feast. Why? so that they may greet the Messiah. And if any confirmation or further confirmation is needed, Jesus, that Jesus will return at the Feast of Tabernacles, the fact is that the Feast of Tabernacles is immediately preceded by the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets and then the Feast of Tabernacles. You know that when Jesus comes again, the trumpet will sound. The Bible says that he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. When the seventh trumpet sounded in the book of Revelation. In Revelations chapter 11 verse 15 
we read that when the seventh trumpet sounded, there was a great noise in heaven and a great voice saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It's interesting that on the eighth day of this Jewish feast of tabernacles, the Jews hold a wedding ceremony. The last great day of the feast. A wedding ceremony is held and the Jews, every Jew gets married to the law. A scroll is held by a rabbi under a canopy. And on that day, on the eighth day, they begin their annual reading of the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. One day, friends, it will be the wedding of the Lamb. It will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelations 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. That's just one of the reasons that Jesus is returning for his bride. Amen. Years ago, we used to sing a song. It was a hymn about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It went something like this. I'm not going to sing it. The signs around in earth and sky. Uh, uh, the signs around in earth and air are painted on the starlit sky. God's faithful witnesses declare that the coming of the Savior draweth nigh. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy we welcome his returning. It may be morn. It may be night or noon. We know he's coming soon. The final words in the Bible were the words of Jesus. Found in Revelation 22, verse 20. And Jesus says, surely I come quickly. Or yes, I am coming soon. How soon is soon? At first sight of that verse, the word leaves the impression that it could be any moment now. Soon. The writers of the New Testament, they held the possibility that Jesus would return in their lifetime. Notice when Paul's talking about we who are still alive. He's not saying uh, they who are still alive. He's talking about we. So Paul expected Jesus to come in his lifetime. Many of the, the apostles expected the return of the Lord to come in their lifetimes. And yet the apostles died. And the years rolled on. And the Lord hadn't returned. The second coming of Christ hadn't happened. And the second coming of Christ became a topic of ridicule. Even before the last page in the New Testament is written, the hecklers were mocking, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as it was from the beginning. Friends, the problem is even worse for us. Those who suffered the hecklers then had only two generations. We've got two millenniums behind us. And the Lord hasn't come. Remember, each generation of believers really believed that Jesus would come in their lifetime. So how soon is soon? The very chapter that has this scoffing jibe about where is the promise of his coming. Everything's just continuing as it was. It also includes a, a twofold answer for the delay. Time, as far as God is concerned, is far different from how we perceive time. 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. So we should take this word soon, coming quickly, soon, with God's sense of time rather than ours. The second coming, friends, is the very next big event on God's calendar. Even if it's not on ours. Just a day or two more. Maybe a few more hours in God's calendar. 
or a few more minutes, then the Lord will return from heaven. Often in the Bible, the coming of Christ is referred to as we do not know the day or the hour. It's talking about just a short space of time. The Bible says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He only seems slow to us who operate on a different time scale to God. And in an age where everything is quick, instant products, everything is, is fast moving. We want things and we want it now. So when the Lord says, I'm coming soon, we immediately think it's going to happen. And yet our soon is not God's perspective of soon. Even the saints can become tired, waiting for his return. One person read the verse in Hebrews 10.37, For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not delay. And he cried out, but Lord... It is a very long little while. It's taking you a long time. In a little while, here you will come. So why did the Lord leave this word soon in the Bible? Knowing it could be misunderstood by our human minds. It could lead us to disappointment and impatience. I believe God put this word soon in and left it in to remind us all, friends, to start getting ready for his coming now. Jesus is not concerned about what we are doing when he comes back. He is more concerned what we are doing while he delays his coming. He's more concerned about how we're living our lives when he's not here. Jesus told a parable about the man who went away and because he'd been away for such a long time, the man who he'd put in charge of things, he said in his mind, my Lord delays his coming. And he began to mistreat his servants. And the Lord came back suddenly and he was angry with him. God is more concerned what we are doing when he's aware than what we'll be doing when he comes back. I often used to say, Maybe you've said it as well. I wouldn't like to be doing this if the Lord was to come again. If the Lord was to come now and found, you know, we used, we used to say about being in the pictures or being in the dance hall. If the Lord was to come and find us, I wouldn't like to be here when the Lord, if the Lord was to come and find us in the dance hall. He's more concerned about what we're doing now than what we're doing when he comes. How we're living our lives. A little boy been to Sunday school and uh, he came back home excited because they'd been talking about Jesus coming soon. And he rushed into the house and he said to his mom, has he come yet? His mom said, who? He said, Jesus. They've told us at Sunday school that he's coming soon. Has he come? His mom said, no, he hasn't come yet. Next day he rushed home from school. Has he come? Mom said, no, he's not here yet. And the next day he came, has he come? No, he hasn't come yet. By the end of the week, the little boy was so disappointed that the Lord hadn't come. You know what he said to his mom? Well, I guess I'll just have to go outside and play now then. Friends, we've got to be careful that we don't go outside and play while the Lord delays his coming. We've got to be focused We've got to be ready. We need to keep constantly in mind our accountability to him on that day. And the second reason I believe that the Lord's coming is delayed and why it's beneficial, it means that judgment is postponed. God is reluctant to close the door of salvation quickly. The Bible says he is not willing that any should perish. He's patient with us. Not wanting any to perish, but everybody, the Bible says, to come to repentance. The same God who waited patiently before sending the flood, I believe he's waiting patiently before sending his son the second time. The delay affords us the opportunity as believers 
to change our ways of living before it's too late. The bride, the Bible says, has made herself ready. Seeing then that all these things must shortly come to pass, what manner of persons ought we to be? What type of lives should we be living? If we are disappointed for ourselves because of the Lord's delay, we should be delighted for the sake of others. In our discussion, in our life group, a few weeks ago, it was saying, we, we said in the, in the life group how, how the coming of the Lord really should stir us to evangelism and to see our loved ones, one for Christ. And some were commenting, if Jesus had come, so-and-so would be lost, he'd be left behind. Friends, because the Lord delays his coming, the door of salvation is still open. And people can still come up, go into it. And that should urge us to, salve, to, to get people saved, to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And let's face it, if the Lord had come 50 years ago, or 30, or even 10, or for some of us five years ago, none of us here, some of us here, friends, would have never known the love that God has for us. The fact is, Jesus is coming again. His return cannot be this year. We do not know the year at this moment in time when the Lord will return. But I believe we do know the time when he will come. He will come right on time during the Feast of Tabernacles that is foretold and laid out in the Scriptures. The question is this morning, friends, are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Are you living for his return? May God help every one of us to see the day approaching and have our lamps trimmed and burning. Be like the five wise virgins who got oil while there was time for their lamps. For at midnight the cry went out, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Five were prepared and five were unprepared. I believe, if anything, these sessions that we're having on the end times, they are designed by the Spirit of God to get us prepared for His coming. May God help every one of us to prepare our hearts.